Welcome to Gem Collectors with Sean. I am that Sean, have been for seven years doing this podcast and nine years doing a live show at Gem Shopping Network um, that, of course, this show is affiliated with as well. So, yeah, long history here at a network that has been here for going on or 26 years and um, or 24 7. So, if you decide in the middle of the night you wake up and instead of getting that drink of water you kick on that tv you go to well you can access it straight through youtube so most televisions have that access or of course we're in many 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 if not most cable um networks and otherwise so you wake up with that craving to just get a treat yourself to that um rock or mineral specimen that you saw and um you can do it. You can do it um, in the middle of the night. Anytime you get that, um, you get that, you know, where you can't stop with just one. And that happens to be the problem with this show is there is mostly only one of each item that you see. This is not one of the shows where we um, very seldom I can do a. Um, multiple what we call a multiple in other words you know one price for any of the items that you see um, because so many items are uh, a little bit different in when it comes to crystal specimens and whatnot and they're thereby changing the price um, but I have done uh, giveaways with a uh, free item with purchases at different times and there are occasions with parcels where I can do multiples, but there are only a few. The key that you do need to realize though, when you see this show is that if you see something you really like, don't hesitate because so many times it will be sold out in that case from under you. Now, if you don't get to watch the show for a day or two, that lessens your chances at the uh, item being available. Out of all the shows here at Gem Shopping, uh, by way of percentage of items sold ver versus items shown, I have one of the highest, if not highest, percentage uh, in that <laughs> in that um, statistic. So um, we don't get to show that many items, also. So you know, uh, because this is not just a show and sell. Um, podcast. It is a show and tell. And what we tell about something, the cool thing is you can buy it as well. So um, that's a treat. All right. So what I need to wish everybody is one day later, a happy uh, Easter and happy holiday. I hope all of you have had I should have wished it to you in <laughs> when I recorded last sh the last show because it posted on, of course, the Monday before. But it seemed like Easter was too far away to think about that. So uh, in this show, take my uh, well wishes for all of you, and then also for all of you um, parents who had had the children either prior to Easter or after for spring break. And if you get to take them somewhere, be safe. If you have them, stay at home, uh, be safe also. I am one of six children, so my mom and dad, bless their ever-loving hearts. Um, they were married for 42 years until my mom passed away 30 years ago. My dad uh, remarried a wonderful lady that my mom even chose for him, so to speak, and he went on to be married another um, 29 years to, to her, so um, uh, quite the track record. And of course, I haven't done so well in that department. Um, um, yeah, until I found my um, true soulmate. And that, of course, is, as, as all of you know, is the Raven, who once I knew that she had a rock collection of her own, and I didn't even believe it because other, other, some other women have said, yes, oh, we like rocks. Yeah, they like the rocks, the kind I can give them and put on their hand. And their rock collection, you know, might be uh, been a uh, quartz crystal they got, you know, panning a couple decades prior or something like that. No, 
<laughs> Raven had started collecting at 10 a year prior to me. And when she started showing me some of her items, she didn't choose <laughs> having any idea of what she was actually buying by way of like chemical formula of a crystal or anything like that. Like I would view and know about something, she bought them strictly on a um, uh, visceral reason, just strictly by eye appeal or how they spoke to her. And oh my, she can read a, um, a specimen based on just tuning into it, I guess. It would be a hippie way to say it, which of course she is a uh, one of the last of the Grateful Deadheads, a true Grateful Deadhead, and has all the um, memorabilia to prove it. And uh, so, yeah, um, it only was natural that she would be into rocks and minerals and, uh, and, and those kind of things. So, yep, we have a, uh, between the two of us, you know, I don't know, um, 50, you know, 90 years of collecting experience. And so over that time, um, Mass quite the collection that I am working out of because um, <laughs> if I did it, how could I? My my only child, my son, who has no interest in rocks, would have no idea what to do with these things. So you're getting now down to um, as I said a year or two ago, because we uh, have been never have I um, purchased one additional item in seven years. Every item you have seen, and that's why so many of them are saying Sean's because we're now into um, what is, I considered my personal collection. Um, and as time went on, that's why I would say we would get down to some better stuff. You're gonna see that. Now, also, we have, since we have Matt, who I know now is a responsible collector in that department that begins with an R, um, <laughs> the scary word, I have a uh, couple specimens I'll show, but I know others are also interested in those, so it's wide, uh, wide open on whoever wants them. We'll discuss those more and uh, talk about those when we get to them. Let's get to the comments, and then, of course, the trivia question wasn't a question this week. It was a who am I or what am I? And so we'll show those again uh, in a moment, and then discuss the winner and uh okay so we have cindy in pennsylvania hello rock family that was a wonderful show cannot wait to see the treasures you have for next week sean trivia all right so the specimen that she said was on the left the lavender color one lavender and tourmaline and the one on the right feldspar well you would happen to be pretty well correct because the one on the left, the lavender one, is lapidolite. The secondary mineral in it that was crystallized is quartz. The one on the right is, you could call it several different things, but I'll accept the broad uh, definition of feldspar, but it is, happens to be that particular one that I actually had found. Technically, it would be, a, a uh, in this instance, an orthoclase and would uh, belong in the Moonstone family range of uh, feldspars, even though there are several different feldspars that will have a uh, reflective sheen, have, have a, well, they come under different names. If it's labradorite, it's labradorescence, uh, et cetera. So um, those are the correct answers. We'll see who gets uh, them right again. Continuing, till next week, Cindy says, in South Central Pennsylvania. Mr. Anthony in Massachusetts says, hello, all great show. Really enjoyed hearing about young Sean working with the folks at the mines at um, Dahlonega. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, just a uh, correction, even though I uh, had been in Dahlonega and actually um, did <laughs> work, not technically, but helped out at that mine also, but many, many years ago, young Sean, that is when I was in the Cowie Valley of North Carolina, where the ruby and sapphire mines were quite prolific back in the 70s. Now, I went out there only with uh, my son, actually, back in this past December, and took a cruise out there, and mines were very hard to find, because the signage wasn't the same, and they were depleted. There was only a couple that were actually um, looked like that they would be operating. 
And so, of course, that was a long time ago. But yeah, what I was referring to uh, again last week was when I would um, very quickly picked up on the, when people would get the native buckets, in other words, the gravel that was actually from the Cowie Valley and not salted with Indian uh, corundum or Indian rubies, which there was certainly nothing wrong with that. And that's why I said them salting, me getting a salted bucket where I actually found big rubies, corundum that they put in there is the difference because I could see it, it was red, and I could see the six sides to the crystal and it looked like something. But the native stones, it, they just look like another pebble, especially the sapphires. They, they go in the, down the flume, they go in the, through the screen, they go in uh, um, when you're down to the end of them and they look like every other rock to someone, uh, to a tourist, to someone not familiar with that. And unless they're red enough, uh, you know, to be a ruby, you know, and even garnets aren't even found that much. So often people would be uh, disappointed. The salted buckets were cost more money then, but you were of course going to guarantee to find something even if it was from other parts of the world. So. Once I learned what they looked like, I would go to the end of the flume line. And as the material would wash down and pile up, I would just sit there and I'd pick out, be able to pick out the stones um, and, and um, keep them. I was later politely told that that's what the owners actually would do was recycle the material because so much of it was missed. But in the meantime, um, before, <laughs> while they put up with me, because I would walk the line and uh, help the um, tourists spot stones that and show them what they would look like, um, and just did it for for fun so I could hang out um, at 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 the flu line, and uh, because that was always helpful, and, and I worked for free at when I was like 14, 15, uh, 13, even when. Um, I uh, was was often going out there to uh, to the Cowie Valley. Now you know it, things change. It's just not the same. It, a lot of things were built up. It's not the the quaint little valley that that uh, that I remember. You know, it's just not the same. And I'm sure uh, you know that was 50 years ago. So yeah, but um, uh, nevertheless things that were the same and are the same is Chunky Gal. And let me just, since the eclipse is coming up and so many people are talking about it, well, the last eclipse that actually came near us was only a few years ago. And I actually, the actually center line of the total eclipse was right past, right over the Chunky Gal Mountain. And I, that's the last time and the first time in a long time prior that I camped out by myself and along um, a, a well-known creek for its garnets up there. And so uh, I went up, and it's also at 4,000 feet, and found uh, some other people had the same idea and knew that one side of the mountain was cleared off at, uh, at one time uh, from a fire, and so you had a complete view of the, the sky and the eclipse. So me not being mm, a people person, so to speak, in, in situations like that, and I was by myself, so I just uh, hiked past the gate that was closed off and up to a bend and where I had a big open field. So it was 100%. And you know I can see why back in the Mayan days, if you could predict an eclipse, and you could hold power and sway over the people if you knew and you know you could say okay if you don't obey me and do as I say I will darken the skies in the middle of the day and then it happens you can imagine um, what how people would take that because it went black and it was so bizarre um, even if you're at 97 95 percent totality or obscurity they call it you still is the light but when you're at right in the middle and it's totally dark and it was dark for almost two minutes, it was really an amazing event. So 
I looked it up. It doesn't come anywhere near Georgia, but we have 85% obscurity. And that, it, it, when you see that, you think that, oh, it'll get dark. dark. No, it really does <laughs> that much. You have to be near the, uh, or within the, the cone of obscurity. Uh, and the closer to the center line, the longer it lasts. Now, Barbara, we'll talk about that in a minute. So, Mr. Uh, Anthony goes on to say, a belated thank you for the beautiful mixed parcel of faceted gems. They come in handy for sure. A couple weeks ago, I scored, scored the petrified cola wood slab from Turkey. You know, I, that was one of the items that I did see was sold. And when I saw it was sold, I said to myself, I said, I bet Anthony got that. And it is good to see you did because that is rare. And of course, you've probably looked it up by now. Um, and of course it's called cola wood because there's Chris Cola in it and I didn't have time. Uh, Asif was kind enough to let me show that last item in real quick at the end of last week's show because it was so unique and I, and I meant to get that in. And so the um, only place where there's Chris Cola, green, in with the petrified wood and there is some of those streaks that you could cut a cab of, out of and create that uh, in that. Now, um, there are pieces of course with a lot more Chris Cola, but <laughs> It wouldn't be as cheap um, as that one because that kind of wood can get really expensive. Trivia, lapidolite on the left, getting that right, and um, with maybe a variety of barrel, very good on the second um, extra credit answer on the other mineral because barrel often is found with lapidolite. So that is a wonderful, wonderful answer. Um, making sure. It's not, but it does appear to be quartz, so very good on there. The one on the right, a good answer as well, saying sulfur. Um, I have had sulfur before. That would be a big sulfur crystal, and uh, being at the color that uh, it is, and you'll get to see that in a, in a moment, uh, I see why you went with the uh, sulfur answer. Um, eyes down, as always. Anthony says, we both know that's where rocks are found. Miss Elisa in Florida. Hello, Professor Sean, the lovely Raven, GSN crew, and rock family. Miss Penny, thank you for sharing some of the rocks right from your backyard. That was really neat to see. Professor, I got your North Carolina yellow barrel piece a while back that you were talking about, and I agree with you. The New Hampshire helidor really is something even compared to the North Carolina piece. So I wonder, Miss Elisa, who got that? Um, piece that was from the Crabtree mine and that golden barrel, big, mm. really rare. I say that because that's one of the ones I know, you know, was a tra kind of treasured and I offered that at a really reasonable price. So I mentioned in my show last week, cause I didn't know, now I know who got that. I said, whoever got that, this Heliodor piece from New Hampshire, remember, remember these items are part of my Made in the USA collection. The two collections I focus on was Made in the USA, items from the uh, mineral specimens, gems from the USA. The other was my birthstone, being January, being Garnet, having six family members to the Garnet family made it a nice wide selection of items that I could find uh, and enjoy collecting. So that Heliodor from New Hampshire, from that particular mine is just a beautiful specimen. And I think, you didn't say so specifically, but it sounds like you got that one. Because I said, whoever got the one from the Crabtree mine, this would be a great made in the USA. Very rare to get the two um, places, two rare places Golden Barrel can be found in the United States and have one from each. So uh, I said, whoever got the other one, it'd be great to get this one. And it sounds like you did. My answer to this week's trivia is from the Micah Group, Lapidolite with a quartz crystal question mark. Yes, you got the extra credit right. And then number two is from the Feldspar Group, Orthoclase. Wow, bingo on both. My favorite item of the week was the Shattuckite and Malachite specimen. That was an amazing specimen. But just wait. Wow. My kids are on spring break this week. It's hard to believe that summer is just around the corner. Have a good week, everyone, and happy Easter, Elisa. Yes, Miss Elisa, Raven and I were talking about that driving in this morning that we're not really ready for summer because it's just so hot here. And you're in Florida, you know what that like. It must like it, but it pretty much, when you become heat intolerant, um, keeps you camped inside. I just, uh, so, 
I got a little bit of time left to get outside and do uh, my outside gardening. Um, and then the summer heat of Georgia comes too early. Miss Gabby, greetings, GSN Rockhound family. Yep, last week I too was laughing with tears at the Asif Sean comedy relief show. Yes, Asif gets first billing. So much fun. Glad everyone enjoyed the pick of Sean's basement. I <laughs> uh, can't take full credit for that. John actually found it and sent it to me. He knows us all so well. And if you missed that, I think it goes back two weeks now where uh, we put a picture up of um, a man working at a bench with rocks, with rocks and minerals all around him. And uh, Miss Gabby said she pictured that was me in the basement. And so if you want a, a, ma a really great picture uh, and a great laugh, you gotta see that because it really did uh, strike home. Miss Gabby says, missed out on that gorgeous yellow barrel. Hmm, we're just talking about that. But let me say, um, I know it found a wonderful home and I will get to see it again. I did, however, get the switch plate you set aside for me. Thank you. Trivia, withdrawing, lapidolite, and feldspar. Okay, you opted out, you got them both correct. Well done. And that's if, if you want to opt out or one reason you want to opt out for whatever reason. It doesn't, you know, you can um, play the trivia and it's not even competing. I'm just answering the trivia anytime. You don't even have to write anything else. You can just write, you know, send it in and say what it is. And um, wait till you see what today's winner wins, I think, will uh, create some uh, trivia envy, as it was uh, nicknamed quite a while back. And uh, yeah, it's not like I give away something uh, worthless. So um, I, I encourage everyone to, to play. And uh, it seems that the magic of the show, when there is multiple right answers, that and then I draw, uh, you know, a, a number uh, from there, from the winners. And it seems that it, um, the powerful magic of the show, which has been so evident, evenly comes close to evenly dividing up the winners uh, when there's multiple. So in other words, everyone wins, it, it seems, equally in a, um, rotational type of orbital magic is, is all I can say. And um, yeah, it's happened too many times for it to be anything else other than the power of the universe. And we know all about that. Um, Miss Barbara in Brooklyn, who I looked up. Okay, so Miss Barbara, who's been talking about the uh, eclipse, um, I looked up and so I, where I am here in uh, north of Atlanta, in um, Forsyth County, uh, am at 83% obscurity. In other words, 83% of the sun will be covered. Um, and, you know, by the moon and darkened. And you think that at 83% that you're gonna see you know, it dimming to twilight or something like that. You would think it would, but it's amazing how little it takes of the sun peeking around the edge to still make it seem like daylight. So I'm going to predict that I probably will have, will not, even at 83% coverage, probably will barely be able to notice any difference, provided it's a clear sky. Now, Miss Barbara, where she is in Brooklyn, has at 90% obscurity, and that will make a difference. So she, she'll see a, a dimming. But just north of her, the edge of the line is at Syracuse. So the edge of the, what they call the cone of obscurity, um, the center line being, of course, between the two edges of the lines, but the, the, um, the right hand or the uh, easterly side of the uh, 13 states that it goes through, um, is Syracuse, so you do get total obscurity. Now, the further you are to the center line, it extends the amount of time that the sun uh, is covered, so it extends your obscurity time. That's why even though where I lived in Forsyth County when we had the last eclipse was in the uh, cone of obscurity, I wanted to be right in the center line so I had the maximum amount of time because of course 
the amount of time before it comes around again in the Georgia part is who knows how long. But I did read that in Ohio, um, someplace in Ohio, the next time it will be, have this type of eclipse will be in a thousand more years. And the last time it happened was in 1365. And so, yeah, it's like <laughs> when you get a chance to see one of these things, if you're into that kind of thing, um, take advantage of it because you may not get another chance. Um, so at least I know in Georgia, I don't have to go driving anywhere to try to find the center line again because I probably would. And you know why I talk about this? Because guess what? That is what Earth has been made of is items from the cosmos, from the universe, um, starting out with impacting of a couple of asteroids and then building upon that over time, getting large enough to have a mass to begin a gravitational pull and to begin a spin. And then with the pressure and heat having a core, creating a magnetic field and on and on. And that's how planets are formed and why they become circular as well due to the spin. And, but these things take time. <laughs> and, um, but, you got to start somewhere. So um, enjoying astronomy is just another avenue to a um, rock hound's paradise because that is where we were born from. All the gold here on the planet wasn't created here on this planet. It was brought here. That's kind of odd, isn't it? That's kind of weird. Yeah. Yeah. So. brought here from other uh, universal bodies, not brought here from like aliens. They could come here though for other things that we offer maybe. Who knows what may really power us uh, at light year speed and warp speed, Scotty. Miss Barbara, hi, Professor Sean, Raven, GSN crew and the whole rock family. The phrase you were looking for was like and subscribe. That's hitting the thumbs up button and getting notification when the next episode appears. I know because I was actually new to that. It was only when the show hit the 10,000th subscriber and marketing notified <laughs> us to do you know, about a thank you that um, I even kind of looked at that thing and realized that, you know, over seven, almost seven years of the time of doing this show, never once, never once had I ever asked for a like and subscribe. Now I know the term. Didn't even know the term, obviously, till now. And so when I realized that, and then, you know, I've noticed other podcasts, and they all, all those guys, like first thing they say, middle of the show, they say, last thing they say in the show is, is, is that. And I'm glad I wasn't a, uh, a, a carnival hawkster asking for your like and, and subscribe. Maybe I should never have learned the term. But thank you, Miss Barbara, now that I know uh, that is what it's called. Thanks to the support crew who have dropped the show consistently at 3 p.m. for over a month now. We should call it Mineral Tea Time, an afternoon with Sean and a cuppa. I feel if we're going to complain, it's only fair to give out attaboys in equal measure. I agree. There was a change here at gem shopping and that department did uh, change out per some personnel and that show does get put up um, even early at times. So um, definitely uh, credit due there. Thank you for the blue diamonds. I was tempted by the clear ones last week and here I get even better blue ones as a prize for free. Kismet. I have always wondered what cut makes efficient use of the mackle shape. And Gabby and I wonder how they managed to cut 57 facets on Mini Millie, by laser or by hand. Okay, so let's answer a couple of those things. I am glad you like the, the, the blue natural crystals, and I'm sure you have looked at them with high power magnification by now and to see how cool they really are. Of course, the color is uh, radiated uh, as opposed to the white ones, and that's neat. The blue ones actually are and do show better than the white ones when you're looking at them. And if I had a choice between the two, I would actually want the blue ones. But I had started off with six parcels of those blue ones and you guys didn't want, not, you know, you guys, not 
generalizing, I guess I should say, didn't um, want them. So I made them really inexpensive. You still didn't want them. And it's like, these are, you couldn't go find these if you wanted to. And no, you can't afford big ones, but if you know how to take the, even with your, because I, I do it, and I've showed you the little lenses you can get, real inexpensive, that hook on, or just clip on to a iPhone now, or whatever, smartphone. Take amazing close-up photos, but then I have this gizmo I got for real inexpensive at a, it was at a toy store actually, a hobby store, and it plugs into the computer and it goes up to like 600 X times magnification, you know, as opposed to a, a loop, a jeweler's loop is 10 X power. This is like six or, and, and it has other multiple choices for magnification. It makes those things look any size you want them to be. And the detail is so beautiful and you don't need any better than that. And of course you just can take the picture with, uh, with that. Um, and it really makes for, um, great educational purposes because you can actually show all these different diamond shapes that you wouldn't otherwise have been, have collated elsewhere. And here you have them yourself. So most of them are mackles. Let's talk about the mackle. The mackle is roughly a triangle shaped, very thin diamond that is found alluvially and otherwise. And it's like, what do you do with that? Well, I can tell you what exactly what they do with that dangong <laughs> shape. Um, they cut them into trillions. And I have had the displeasure of having to set trillions that are so paper thin that the corner point would just snaps off if you are not really skilled at setting that type of diamond. Marquee and the point of a pear shape diamond, but both of those tend, due to the um, pavilion, tend to be um, um, firmer, less likely to chip off. The trillions, they are able to facet them so that they appear to have some brilliance, so that they do not fish eye. That means being able to see straight through them, even though the angles are below the critical angle, meaning the minimum angle it takes uh, so it doesn't create a fish eye. Between the two angles, they'd be able to figure this out, but they have very little actual life. What you get is size because of the, how thin they are relative to the um, measurements they don't weigh much. They are still very expensive. Trillions are one of the most expensive cuts to buy. And you don't really know the difference in the brilliance and scintillation until you have a trillion that is cut to the proper angles, especially in the pavilion. And then you see all this brilliance and, and um, reflectivity and, and rainbow of colors that you didn't see in one of these thin cut stones. But here's the thing, because of the high price per carat that they cost, the weight goes up a lot when they're cut properly. So you can pay often twice as much due to the uh, height of the crown and the depth of the pavilion. And uh, that makes a big difference in most cases, of course. I can't uh, tell you how hard it was to set all these thin, thin cut trillions. And I knew right then that that's what they were doing with them. And yes, um, it was confirmed later when I talked to, of course, uh, cutters and people familiar with that end of the trade, that mackles are often very clean. And so uh, it, very often, the tr almost all the trillions I got were very nice, clean, and they're often very white. And, and so that was possible. So that's what they do with that. Now, 57 facets, yes, I wouldn't have believed it. I took one of those little goobers. Uh, now, I'm talking about the diamonds I showed or sold offer for sale the other week that were 0.8 and 0.9 millimeters. Now, remember, a one-point diamond is 1.3 millimeters. When you get down to, there was three of these stones to one point, to one point, 
So they were basically one third of a point, and they were full cut, and I didn't believe it myself. I mean, they at first looked at it from a visual, which was difficult to see itself, but I actually was able to get one in a pair of tweezers without it flipping out of the tweezers and get my really high powered 35 power loop that is, um, you always see me use it. Oh, it's in my pocket. Um, and I looked to see if it did have all the proper facets that it's supposed to have, and it did. It did. That little stone was a full cut. Now, they, the price does go up on those. And here's the thing. I do know how they cut them. And I saw a picture one time, and it was a picture from an Israeli, of course, diamond cutting center. And in a row, just about as long as you could see, it was all computerized and it was automated. So they, it was a automated computerized faceting setup where they did it all by computer, um, which was quite um, impressive. And I wondered how else could they do it competitively like that. Now, I think that yes, there are um, cutting houses in India that do and can cut some of these by hand. And I think that considering the cost of a computerized fastening machine versus what you can pay in rupees in India, someone comes the quality. I, the Indian uh, automated cutting, you know, is only going to cut really nice goods, quality goods. Um, the by hand cut goods are going to be a uh, lower quality that uh, can be done cheaper actually uh, if they do it by hand. Amazing enough, I did see though some that had some facets that were not perfectly in place lined up. They were there, but they, the meats were slightly off. But I mean, I could see that happening even with a computerized setup. So I, I don't know. I think it's just. Uh, Amazing they cut them with that many facets at all. So, um, but yeah, I, I think that it is done um, with automation uh, and computerized. And of course, you know, if they can do, you know, make these precision chips and so many other these micro things uh, with the uh, perfection that they do uh, with, with uh, automation and computers, then yeah, they could easily cut those little stones with 57 facets. Goes on to say, snag the Shattuckite and Malachite and the Coral Ammonite group. Oh, you got the Shattuckite piece. I have always wanted to see Shattuckite under the microscope and never owned any. Like Duftite, an accessory mineral in a soft, unique color, overshadowed by other bold partners. Indeed, a rare Shattuckite piece. That's, that was a beautiful specimen, especially for the money. As to the trivia, the glittery lavender looks like lapidolite mica. The indistinct glassy crystal has a somewhat puffy triangular cross section, so let's call it a tourmaline. The opaque beige rom looks like a cleavage crystal of heavy weathered calcite. I will opt out since I just got a lovely prize. Counting down to the 4-8 eclipse, speaking of, got to get my special viewing glasses or we'll have to resort to my cheap childhood hack of a pinhole in a shoebox. Take care all, Barbara from Brooklyn. That's how we were all taught, was the pinhole in a shoebox trick. Um, so, I saw the glassiness and I'm looking at that. I will, I think they're little quartz silica vesicles vesicles, little vugs that were filled with silica, but I'm going to check to make sure they're not the uh, tourmaline, because I understand about that look you're talking about. Mr. Charles in Oregon. Ciao, fellow rock hounds. Great episode this week. I want to thank Penny for sending in the local rocks for show and tell. I have basalt in my area, too, some of which has similar looking yellow staining. The crystal growing demonstration is going to be awesome to see. It is going to be awesome, and I can't wait to do it. I'm going to get it together here. I'm hoping that tomorrow after work, when I have a chance to call in, that items I'm interested in are available. Sending good vibes here. I haven't been having any luck with that and feeling a bit guilty for not being able to make a decision in time to support the show. 
What's meant to be will be. That is the magic of the show. And that's exactly right, Charles. That's why no bad feelings if you miss out on something because everything really does work out and happen and it divides up the goodness amongst everybody uh, equally and in the fashion that you're supposed to receive something. I don't know. I think that's just sometimes, sometimes true. When you have, uh, when you do something with good intentions, with a good heart and with people involved, all of you have that same um, good heart and, and vibe that it creates a, uh, a, a central power that um, pervades over, over the show. And, and I don't know, I just wanna believe that. Uh, thank you, Sean, for all the knowledge you share with us. Thank you for the compliment. Take care all and have a great week. With love, Charles. With love, back to you, Charles, indeed. And yeah, um, sometimes having those vibes to try to get the items you want don't always work. A, a quick decision and a, a quick watch of the show while you're at work <laughs> might help. Uh, identity of number one, it is too difficult for me to tell what it is with any confidence. I would just guess that it is fluoride. That's not a guess, that is an answer based on um, the information that you, uh, your mind perceived at the time. And so therefore it is not a guess, it is a answer based on that. Um, identify number two, isn't that the Moonstone Feldspar you found when they were digging for the housing development? <laughs> ding, 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 ding. Boy, you nailed that one exactly correct. Um, well done there. <laughs> okay, so that is it. And now let's show the specimens. And we'll have, uh, then I'll show what the and who the um, winner is. All right, so here, look at this. Okay, there is our lavender lapidolite. Now, here are the other. Um, little items I was wondering. I see what you mean by the triangular shape. Uh, I think by way of the color that it is more of a uh, quartz. I'm looking, I do not, I see that triangular one. Hmm. <laughs> I see that though it is a six six sides there, so that's a pretty and there's a six sided crystal right there, so it's kind of well defined. So I'm going to still go with the the quartz because I think of the uh, conchoidal fracture, even though that's very similar to tourmaline as well. Interesting specimen, but you can definitely see the lapidolite mica part of that uh, being a lithium mica and uh, the lavender color, most common color. But remember, we also have yellow lapidolite that was discovered. Look at this. This is exactly that specimen. I found myself at that uh, development where I noticed a ditch was dug in a funny manner. And if you see enough mining situations, you can see things like that uh, from the road. It was probably 100 yards off, and I pulled into uh, what was going to be a uh, building for some kind of construction. And um, they were actually digging and following at a diagonal angle a vein of this material. So whoever had the backhoe knew they were chasing something. But um, of course, in looking at the tailings and all, I don't think there was anything Magnificent, but they passed up what I thought was definitely something collectible and very obvious as to what it was. And uh, that's a big crystal of, of feldspar, which to me is pretty cool to find with, I believe that to be, I guess, a uh, quartz, piece of quartz, but it's got a funny, let's see, one, two, three, four, funny kind of uh, shape to it. Um, so not 100% positive. So just an extra little goody there to be uh, sussed out at some other point. Okay, now the winner, there was um, one person that answered it 
to uh, the best of all available answers and extra credits on top of that. And that was Miss Elisa in Florida. Congratulations. Let me show you which one. Look at this. Look at this. Here is your free item. And uh, wow, don't have another one. This is the only one, uh, anything like it. And of course, beautiful, beautiful chloride in quartz. And this is a total natural formation, the crystal, look at that. So it's not even polished sides. They, um, with the striations, completely, completely natural. Here's a, uh, a, a natural for <laughs> split in the crystal. And then there's some of this. So, so it was in the, the uh, pocket for a while to have a little buildup of, uh, of mineralization there that can probably be uh, scraped off if, if you wanted. Um, but it does show a the classic fracture here, which does look very similar to what we just saw in that lapidolite. So um, that's a pretty neat way to learn everybody. When you see something like that, pay attention because this is actually one of the identifying characteristics of a mineral um, rock or gem specimen is the type of fracture. And there are the different types uh, that are uh, listed. and. Uh, to learn from everything from uneven to conchoidal to subconchoidal, etc. Um, now, look at that. So this is a nice size, very showy specimen. That's a great angle right there. Even has extra little. That look, look at that. So, congratulations because that. Quartz is always one of the most magical and most powerful of all the crystals. Uh, obviously, since it uh, was originally what uh, powered all the radios and um, was uh, the ability of a quartz crystal uh, and its electrical properties, silicon, silicon dioxide. So, of course, Silicon Valley, you know, you've heard of that? Well, that is all based in the name because of the origin of silicon as uh, in quartz as, of course, the original um, conductor of, uh, of it all. All right, let me put that away and we'll be back with the start of the show. Huh. Okay, you might first think that this is a uh, Moroccan blue bear, right? But no. No, and the way you can tell is the thickness of the barite crystals. Um, the blue barites that, of course, I've offered here before and, and still have some, they have those much narrower, thin blades and uh, a, a fairly recent uh, find. This is from a much more rare locality, the Terracita mine in um, Murcia, Spain, and you can see the nice thickness to the classic shape of barite crystals, especially when you see this sandwiching like this, the layering of them like that. Um, uh, that's classic. And then you can um, see there's actually crystals all around. Now, Barite has uh, been mined, actually, not far from here, up in Carters, Cartersville, Georgia, and uh, is what considered one of Georgia's uh, commercial minerals that have been mined here. Um, and, and actually, the uh, owner of, uh, original owner, is what originally started the Weinman Mineral Museum, which now has become the Telus Mineral Museum up in Cartersville. So highly recommend if you're ever going down I-75, you're gonna go right past it. You can see the big massive museum building right from the road. And you know, it is worth whatever time you can commit to going and seeing an amazing collect uh, mineral museum right here in the state of Georgia, which is we're quite fortunate to have. And uh, I have been a, a course supporter of. So you have classic other oxides, probably manganese oxides, you know, um, the pyrolusite type of things, and some limonite also. Maybe, maybe there's some uh, uh, gertite in there. Um, actually, uh, I see some um, botroidal formations even. So yeah, botroidal is a, a crystallized formation, so that's kind of cool. 
And then look at the bottom. You have some of the best color in those crystals on the bottom of the specimen. Um, so just a really uh, fantastic, classic, uh, old timer type of specimen from a unusual origin. So if you collect uh, these type of minerals, um, BASO4, barium sulfate, and a lot of people have had, uh, yeah, look at, look at those. Again, very cool, has, you know, have uh, had to um, use barium for different reasons for stomach type of uh, issues. So anyway, here is a um, wonderful, wonderful piece and with very aesthetic with the way the crystals are perched up there. And I have this at a uh, uh, amazing opportunity for a collector at only $68. Yeah, so only $68 on that, which um, can only be described price-wise as amazing. Now, now, let me show you. I have a, right here, 117060. Two four, one one seven zero six two four, and that gets you something you don't often see a, a ring. Yep, look at that, look at that, and um, Colombian emerald. And this is this ring goes back to the days when uh, we had the doing the live show, and we had so many. Um, uh, well, my business partner. Uh, made regular trips to Colombia, and we dealt in many, 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 many Colombian specimens of every time, and jewelry. Uh, not <laughs> a lot of Colombian emerald jewelry of all different types, incredible crosses, massive, beautiful pieces, beautiful, beautiful emeralds of all types. Well, this is one of um, the uh, holdovers that actually uh, Raven has uh, had, and you can see there's, it's, it's just not worn, and she um, uh, donating it uh, to the cause, so to speak. Um, and you can see it is, uh, it is stamped on the inside, and I'm looking at .925, look at that, I, that's me. I can actually was wondering about that. That is me with my uh, inside ring engraver. I just wanted to make sure it, this ring didn't say love you forever or something. Um, so anyway, this is about a carat and a half center size center stone. You can see, so be careful on a mandrel or telling you, Julie, if you need to have it sized. Of course, I can size it for you for, you know, 20 bucks or something. Um, if I priced it higher, I could... Um, <laughs> do the sizing for free. So one one way there or the other, it it ends up to uh, to cost in that kind of thing because of the way this is priced. So um, let me show it next to my ruby ring, and that way you can get a good idea of how that looks. Okay, so look at that. You can see how big that is. Wow, that is a big stone. And sterling silver, I can gold plate it for you. Uh, that wouldn't cost you any extra. Um, if, uh, if the size fits for you. So bezel set really protects the emerald. So that is why, of course, um, I wouldn't offer something that wasn't uh, uh, user friendly is what I always like to say. Here is an amazing uh, deal, uh, especially with the gold and silver, the way it's been going up. Um, how about if I told you that this ring, remember, it is the May birthstone and it is coming up and this is none too shabby. That emerald, if it was loose, if I priced it at 100 a carat and it was 150 bucks for the emerald, that would be a good value for that stone. I mean, you can see all the way through it. You can see the reflection off the back facets. That's, uh, you know, emeralds, of course, um, I always say if they had a thing such a thing as a type four gemstone, uh, you know, oftentimes emerald would be it, but it's a type three gemstone, which means it is found most commonly with inclusions in it. Whereas like tanzanite is a type one, which means it is found most commonly without inclusions in it. 
This stone, uh, my, one of my favorite cuts, the square emerald cut or square step cut, and the entire ring, I am offering for only $118. Only $118. And you, can see, you saw how thick the shank was on the piece. And uh, again, it's not prong set. So you have the protection of the bezel and the emerald is, is has, uh, she actually hasn't worn it. So that's her, you know, but a couple few times, you know, she goes by her jewelry every morning and, and I don't know, for whatever reason, um, this hasn't been one she's worn, but she has enough other choices. I think she's actually kind of just overlooked this. So uh, with the great condition that it's in, um, I know that she hasn't worn it much because the emerald uh, is in awesome shape. So only $118. Now let me show you. If you want a go with item number 1139123, and by go with, I mean I have one single earring. Now that is not odd anymore to have a single earring or to sell a single earring. A lot of people, and I know from Raven herself, uh, and uh, how she has uh, an odd number of holes in her head. Uh, no more comment there. Um, look at this stone. <laughs> and she often, like on one side, just wear one, one type of earring. Well, anyway, um, I actually really like the cut. Look at the clarity. This is another Colombian. Now, this is Vermeil, meaning it is a heavy gold um, plating over sterling silver, a nice size back with it as well. And a price. Okay, so you can see my finger uh, roughly by way of the size of it. Oh, here. Here's how you can maybe tell. I'll put this emerald, and look at the match actually, next to it for a size reference. There you go. And they match well in color if you want to get the ring and the earring. What a deal. Because guess what? That earring. <laughs> that earring with the emerald and everything is, well, a, a silly price. How about this? $21. $21. And so that's on sale. I had showed it once before, and I guess you didn't like the uh, $24 price tag. So let's make it 21 and that is uh, silly, 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 inexpensive. Uh, the emerald, especially that clean and that nice cut, should cost that much. Okay, now, I'm just not sure what to show next. You know what I'm going to do? Okay, um, I'm going to show something amazing, amazing, that you have not seen or appreciated. Item number 1171124. If I talked about Gertite, Gertite, yep, 117-1124. So Gertite, named after a gentleman named Gert, um, first uh, is, is where this, this mineral got its name. And so many of you, if I said Gertite, you're, you would squinch up your nose and not be that impressed. Well, let's see if you feel the same way after seeing this for Gertite. Look at that. Now, that is Gertite you're not going to normally see. That is a stunning, specimen. It is from my Made in the USA collection. It is from the Dreamtime claim, and if that sounds familiar, it should, because that's the same claim that the Amazonite crystals I have, correct pronunciation being Amazonite, after the Amazon River where a deposit was thought to be. Um, these, the, this um, 
there were smoky quartz that was well known to come from these claims on Crystal Peak, Colorado, Teller County. Um, not Teller City, I think that someone just put an I in there. I had abbreviated it as County, CTY. Um, smoky quartz, amsonite, and gertite. And the gertite specimens that were found, if you were lucky enough, looked like this. Looked like this. Look at this crystallization. I am going to show you another one from the four man mine. Remember the ones from Morocco in a minute for sale of the Betroidal Gertite. Look at this is, you know, I don't know if you could call it the back. <laughs> this is, I guess, um, stunning. It is completely crystallized with just a little of the um, native uh, clay type matrix. Look at that spray. Look at that spray formation. That is the desired look. And when you look at this closely um, with backlighting, you actually will see some red um, reflections or uh, transparent. Ah, that's a good idea. Let's do that. Let's do that. Wow, that gives you a completely clever, good idea there, Dave. Um, a completely different resolution and um, look to it. Now, let me try something because when I was looking at this closely with backlighting and some magnification, about like what we're looking at now, I could see red lines because at, when I was first um, glance, I thought, oh, could that be rutile? And then I quickly discarded that, and then I thought hematite, quickly discarded that, and then, you know, there was um, a label, but I, I, this was one I had not seen in a while. <laughs> I remember I told you I found some specimens that had uh, I hadn't seen in a while, and this one came completely separate from when I got the amsonite. So um, this was a, um, one that came through a an estate, and uh, so I try to check myself before I look at a label and see if I can actually figure something out. And I nailed it. <laughs> I got it right down to the exact, uh, well, I got it down to Crystal Peak. And then, of course, uh, I always, thank you, so we'll put it, prop it right back here, um, try to get complete information and uh, on it. And it did. So. This is, of course, uh, Gertite. It belongs to the diaspore group. Diaspore. Yes, that diaspore. Um, as in uh, Turkish diaspore, as in color change Turkish diaspore, as in what they want to call those marketing names such as I don't even like saying them, you know, Zarite and other stuff like that. Yeah, that, this belongs to that um, group, oddly enough, because of its chemical formula. So it's technically an, um, well, an iron uh, oxide or hydro, iron hydroxide, and it's a polymorph of, meaning it is the same formula, chemical formula, but different crystal system. So as you know, polymorph of lipidocrosite, so, um, and uh, ferroxenite, which is something you won't probably, you won't probably come across. But um, uh, so quite a collector's piece and uh, Beautiful form, beautiful form. And at a um, price that, again, uh, would be um, 
well below whatever the market exactly is on something like this. Now, uh, I oftentimes don't like to look at what other pricing on things are because uh, I don't want it to influence what I might ask for something. But um, uh, I did see a couple of different prices, and every one of them, though, it said sold. And this was from a, uh, a well-known dealer. So I am making this at, it's well, it's about half to a third of some of the prices that I saw. So here is your opportunity on a one-of-a-kind piece. I do not have another one, and it is only $128. $128 on that. Um, and it, it, look at this. So it's what they would call a, um, a small cabinet specimen, even maybe a medium sized cabinet specimen. And for the, compared to other specimens available, it was um, about, uh, ran in the, in the size. So it's not like small for this type of uh, piece and quality. Uh, it runs right in the range of uh, any others that I saw. So um, a real beauty. This would add to anyone's collection. And here's the neat thing. It's um, kind of like Stibnite now, not Stilbite, remember, which is a zeolite, Stibnite, the antimony, or that it has those striking uh, long, beautiful, metallic, reflective uh, uh, crystals going in all different directions. Those are very, very uh, showy specimens for being a uh, metallic mineral. Same thing here with the hematite. I mean, with the gertite, because <laughs> I still can't believe it's gertite. Uh, it has that, has that look, it has that beautiful, beautiful, reflective look that is very, very showy in a collection. Um, so, excellent opportunity for someone uh, to add a very rare piece to, uh, to their collection at a very inexpensive opportunity. Now, let me show you the what your most commonly used to seeing. Now, unbelievably enough, I shouldn't say it that way, um, but Raven, I when I showed her that piece you're looking at now, and I tried to, of course, ask her what um, she thought it was, and, and she was kind of like hemming and hawing, and I, all I said was, I said, it's one of your uh, less favorite minerals. <laughs> And she instantly said, Gertite. And I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it that she got it right from there. And so let me show you. This is why item, it is for this, <laughs> the only reason. 960820. Uh, let me see. I, let me uh, stand up and get my magnifier out. So this old man can read 960820. Yeah, okay, so let me show you. And I'm going to leave it on this piece of white paper for the moment. And that helps actually explain um, Raven's issue with it. Okay, take a look at this. This is from the four man mine. And when asked why they named it the four man mine, because <laughs> there's four men that mine it. And uh, um, I always laugh at that because it's like, what's what, who was buried in Grant's tomb kind of question. Um, this is how you commonly can find Gertite. And here is why she, because she has to put the specimens out, right? And, and here, I actually turned it to the uh, wider side, but there, that is why because it can be very dusty. In other words, it sloughs off. Um, if you don't touch it or anything, it's just fine. <laughs> and 
if you took a buffing wheel to this, you could high gloss polish it. When I was looking in Mindat and, and referencing some of this, I saw some that had been that had been done exactly to it. They took some of the, no, they didn't pull it out of the mine looking like it was, you know, um, glossy painted black. Uh, it had just been polished. And that's one thing a piece like this would do. It can take a polish. Um, but um, when you have something in so beautifully betroidal like this, how can that not be a, a great specimen for anyone's collection? Now, there's a couple ways you can even see on that side that this can be displayed that's uh, very attractive. And also, let's see if there's one a half. Yeah, so Dave, let's look right here because this is what makes it super cool, if I can see that. Uh, the way it will form will be in, often in layers. You can only see like one layer there. Other ones you can see uh, times at multiple layers. So it um, is beautiful on the half shell, so to speak, when um, you do find one. It has some nice concentric rings. That's a real great display angle right there. And so, you know, you just take it once, use a paper towel, set it in your cabinet. Next to, look at this. I mean, can you believe this is what makes a great um, mineral display is education through display. And so when you have Gertite like this next to Gertite like that, and they both are the same and both have the same crystal system, technically, you know, how does this occur? How, what, how can those two be the same? Well, that's why it takes knowledge to be able to discern one item from another at times because how different Mother Nature can make something uh, look when it comes out of the ground. So, you know, like the old saying, you know, it's not nice to fool Mother Nature. Very difficult to fool with Mother Nature because she's the one that is putting the, the, everything over on us, especially when you try to figure out what is what that she has created. And for these two to be the same mineral and look that different, that is um, hard to understand sometimes, but what an amazing educational display having those two. Okay, so you know the price of that one. Here, this will make it up. How about if I make this specimen a whopping, do I do it? A whopping $12. $12. Yep, that is a what. I know, and it weighs um, remember, a pound is 454 grams, so it weighs over a pound, and you know right where it came from. Four men, mind it. <laughs> okay, now, um, let me put that up, and I'll be right back. Okay, since I know I have at least one, maybe two collectors of, uh, well, I'm just going to say it, um, that appreciate and know how to take care of specimens that have a radioactive signature. Now, I'm showing you this specimen from this angle for a particular reason, because it's only going to get better from here. This is one I have not generally shown. I think one time, and then uh, that was before I had uh, taken the Geiger counter to it. Now, I'm going to demonstrate that in a minute. But let me show you what makes this so amazing besides the fact that it has a count per minute of, you can see in the, uh, in, in the graphics right there, of over 1,000 counts per minute. And I'll show that. It has an um, amazing shortwave yellow fluorescence. Uh, it's from the Astor District and in R2 in there. Let me show you. Here you have the biotite mica, the black mica. 
look at that. Look at that crystal and look at how well formed it is. A very distinct zircon crystal. Now, what will um, uh, what you don't see is most likely the other half of this extends. It could extend like a straight uh, square box and then terminated like that at the other end. For we don't know how far, but the, the crystals can run quite long. You just don't see how long. You see it starting to go to the uh, flat portion of it, but we don't know how far that goes down. Because look at all this other material you would have to, as a uh, um, specimen uh, preparer, you'd have to remove, look at all these other amazing crystals along with the biotite mica. And as we keep turning this, look at that. Here are more zircon crystals. And let's keep looking at that. OK, look, let's look at the clarity. I am going to backlight that and show you. Um, look at Dave right on the money with his timing. Look, look at the uh, different phases of the colors in this zircon. Now, we're going to talk about that in a minute as well. Look at the, uh, some of the intense reds in that. And remember, this extends, we don't know how far, but down into the piece. And so as we uh, go over the rest of this portion over here, we couldn't see very well exactly the crystals, but you can when you light them like this and travel the surface, then you can um, find them better. And you can see with the reflectivity of the different colors, uh, the other ones in this piece. Okay, so look at that, look at, look at that one. Okay, so there's a nice one hiding right there. And look at that termination, the point. So uh, this is a, um, well, that's a well-formed crystal right there. Uh, great color, great color, no telling how large it is. There is another one of a decent size right there as well. And look at how the color extends. Who knows how far? All right, thank you, sir. So. Um, wow, look, so look at this one, which was uh, not that one. That is a complete other, uh, wow, this is, it looks like a twinned crystal. Another one there, as we keep traveling around, you can find them. Look at this on this side, wow. Um, there is another nice, a large one, and again, we have no idea how far down. That's just the end, the termination. And uh, these zircons can run uh, on the C-axis a, a good distance. It's not something like the um, Tanzanian zircons that are just um, more bipyramidal. These can uh, form uh, elongated, more elongated. Okay, so here's the deal. Zircons often contain REEs, rare earth elements. Biotite mica can also be associated with them. And um, one of the ways and one of the things that a um, specimen that has a radioactive signature, what it can do is break down uh, the uh, zircons to where they're metamicked to where they do not have a crystalline structure in them anymore. And that's how you get the green zircons. And they often become kind of cloudy in that process. Also, they can create a discoloring of surrounding matrix uh, and other surrounding minerals 
that are near them. And one of the ways you can tell this is like looking at this exact crystal shape, you see that tannish uh, color right around the crystal. And the uh, radiation, to use that word, is most likely what is causing that. Uh, and you can see that around others and in this same area. Now, let's see just if there is a radioactive signature on this. All right, so you're familiar. You have seen this before. If you have it, you're going to see something that you normally will not see on TV. <laughs> okay, so we'll take this away and we'll take uh, what is uh, the um, regular ambient um, count per minute signature of the air and our surroundings that surround us every day, everywhere we go. So this is in counts per minute, and this can uh, come just from you know the sunlight, uh, radon, or other gases. So you have anywhere from 20 to 50 counts per minute. Now, here is our specimen. Let's take it to an area where we don't see many zircons and see if we get much of a reading. Now, you see we're on this end of it. Okay, well, not doing much of a reading. So it tells you that we're not, that the matrix, this material isn't where the, where Earth elements are, which of course, there's go, has to be uh, thorium-232 or uh, uranium-238. Um, or potassium 40 for there to be a, a signature. Um, so in the matrix here, we don't see anything. Let's turn this around. Let's put it over the top of some zircons. Well, look at that. There we go. We're up to 500 counts per minute. Let's turn this for its uh, in a direction, let me show you and hold it this way so you can see exactly what's going on. And uh, if we pull out just enough to cover the counts per minute, you can see as, as we cover it, see this, we're, so we're covering that zircon. And let's see, we're covering more of the maximum area. You can see it's still screaming in the 700s, 600s, and let me turn it to this way. And we'll put it over, let's do this. We'll put it over this, where we get some of the biotite. And so what this tells me is that it is definitely zircons that are creating the uh, radioactivity because there's nothing in the matrix that is doing it. And if I position this just right, you can hear if I'm quiet, the uh, Geiger counting as it goes up. Look at that 900. There it hits 1,000. You just saw it hit 1,000 counts per minute. And that is my personal threshold in measuring things that I consider something to be of um, a radioactive nature. Now, a lot of people will list, you know, slightly radioactive at 200 counts per minute. Uh, so you have 0.86 there. And um, just depending on how I turn this, it, it'll easily go over the, the thousand mark. So um, I consider that radioactive. I, and, and that would be something that it should be, I think, disclosed. But Nobody knows this. These people mining this don't check these specimens, and not every specimen does that. Let me show you. 
Here is two zircons, and we're going to offer these for sale. These are Tanzanian zircons. And I checked these earlier, and they have, look at that, absolutely no radioactivity. Whereas many other zircons, almost all blue zircons, will have around a 500 count per minute signature. This specimen is outstanding for its zircons. It is the radioactive, it is the REEs and the radioactivity that is helping it to have that strong yellow fluorescence. So if you collect fluorescent specimen, this is for you. If you collect the um, R specimens, <laughs> the radioactive specimens, uh, and responsible collector, then this is for you as well. It has stunning zircons, which I really wish I could see uh, through this. Of course, <laughs> it will also remember how Madame Curie discovered um, some radioactivity was by setting a specimen, I think, on a uh, photo plate, and it developed it. Uh, and so, uh, or something like that, the story goes. And so um, this has a lot of neat properties that are fun to learn and study in that realm. And I know I wouldn't have the uh, <laughs> very expensive Geiger counter if it wasn't something that I enjoyed as well. So. Since I know we have a couple people now interested in these, I am off, wait till you see the next specimen. I am offering this at a discount. With this kind of specimen and these kind of crystals in it, even at a show, it would go for hundreds of dollars. This is rare. I've had this for years. It was the last of the batch. I took the um, entire lot that the dealer was offering that year. Now, you've seen me, or those of you that have been watching my show for years, you've seen me sell them off over the years. But I have held back this one. Look at the shape of that crystal. Uh, this one, because of that factor. It is one of the most populated pieces with zircons that I got out of the whole batch. In other words, there's a lot of crystals in here. Um, I think also the coloration difference in this is also partly due to the breakdown of uh, the stone and the uh, crystal, crystal uh, making it potentially metamicked internally. And um, that is part of and shows it in the different coloring of it. There's so much to learn if you're into that sort of thing. And I am offering this piece for a amazing opportunity for only $118. $118 and out of the entire lot I got, it is in the top five for quality and uh, number of zircons. It's really right up there. Now let me show you. Since we're in that realm, this item, 1170724, 1170724. This is a stunning specimen. Look at this. Look at that. And it is exciting. That is beautiful fluorite. These, this is from Arongo, Namibia. The Rongo Mountains, it's from the Brandberg area, which is known for tremendous quartz crystals, including amethyst. Wait till you see something else I'm going to show you in a bit. And also for anhydros in the quartz specimens. So this, I have not checked for anhydros at all. I would certainly recommend anybody who gets this to check for it. Look at the crystal formation before you even look at the fluoride. Look at how this particular crystal has formed and lies on the other. That is unique. It is also appears to be doubly terminated. In other words, uh, pointed at both ends. It certainly 
looks um, that way, like that is the end of that one. Just like this one, look at this. Okay, so we have another that is terminated at that end, and it doesn't really look like it's, maybe it's growing out of there. Maybe that's not another end. Maybe that's just a beginning. Um, beautiful nonetheless. Let's look at the rest of these. So there's a lot to investigate when it comes to the quartz. Now, let's look at this fluorite a little closer. There we go. Wow. Look at the fluorite and um, those well-formed. Looks like there's a little tinge of purple in some of those. Oh, um, could be some, uh, let's look at this, could be some phantoms. Let me see. Yeah, let's, let's do, there we go. Now we can see in them a little better and also see the clarity and color and you can see the crystal shapes better. So um, there appears to be a little bit of tinting of color in the, yeah, like that. You can see in the corners of that one crystal. Oh, I want to start looking in the quartz <laughs> for an hydros. Um, okay. Now, let's look at the, continue to view this. Let me show you, here's some more. Let's look at this other side. Ah, here is a, another nice grouping of fluorites. But let me show you what is really outstanding on this. And, it is this group right here. These um, cluster of spherules. And let me tell you, they have some of the strongest, strongest fluorescence I have ever witnessed. I didn't need to go in the closet even. I did uh, put my UV light to it in just regular my lighting and I could still see the fluorescence in this group. Let's look at these a little closer with my handy dandy. All right. There we go, perfect. That's what I wanted to show you. They're not exactly all white. Look at the glassiness to them. Okay, can you see that glassiness? As I uh, tilt the angle a little bit, you can see that, comp yeah, now you can actually see what they really are. That, ladies and gentlemen, is hyalite opal. That is, Opal, of course, it is a non-precious variety. And they don't use hyalite technically anymore. And that's why it's in parentheses. It's actually called Opal-A-N. And that is the name. So hyalite has been kicked to the curb, but it's, believe me, going to stick around for a long time. Look at the little... Um, Spheres, they're non-crystalline, remember, because it's amorphous, opal is, so they form like droplets of glass. And what first, when I, so I checked the specimens, this was an estate piece. So when I got this, uh, and just recently, of course, found it, rediscovered it, so to speak. Wow, look at those fluorites next to, uh, next to that. Wow, that's kind of pretty. Um, the first thing I did was I checked it for radioactivity. Yep. And then based on that, I checked it for fluorescence. And both uh, concurred. And then I uh, checked it for other particulars and yeah so it came out as highlight because this was one that um, I had to trace back 
what all was here. So you can see that they have a translucent, some are transparent nature to them. And they go on, you see along the edge. Let me show you, they are there. And then the other place that completely lit up was these areas right here. And I wondered, well, what's going on there? Well, let's take a look. And what did I find? But look at that. More glassy looking bubbles, also known as highlight. Look at that. There we go, Dave. Look at that. And then it was right there as well. And they fluoresced the brightest I think I have ever seen. So that made me think, OK, if we, and I, I of course, already knew that fluorescence in highlight is due to um, uh, uranyl oxides, or basically uranium oxides, uh, uraninite, or versions of it. So I wanted to see to what extent that may maybe played a role. So I came over here and I thought, OK, so let me just check this side with the Geiger counter and see if there's anything over here. And there was nothing, nothing coming from the fluorite, nothing coming from the quartz of any substance. All right, so that checked that. Then I turned it. So I had my base reading from there. And then I turned it to that spot. And let's see what we get. Look at that. Except <laughs> it kept going. <laughs> and it was a, let me turn this. There we go. So oh, I expected somewhere in the two or 300 count per minute. But when it read up in that lit, now remember, you can often get higher readings by a larger mass area. Because every little nodule is putting off a alpha particle. You know? <laughs> and uh, so the more you have, the more, you know, the higher reading you can get. That's why when I turned that zircon a particular way, I was able to get readings from multiple zircons. And it read to 1,000. CPM, but that is what is actually you need to go by because that is, uh, you know, in a particular direction what the highest reading you can get. So look, look at this. So with getting that type of uh, reading in the 600, 700 area, it is why um, just matrix. It's why. It had such high level of fluorescence. I mean, I am talking neon. So then let's see this area over here to prove the theory that it, the uh, fluorescence was caused definitely by um, a radioactive substance. I checked the only other area that fluoresced, which was that area we looked at right there. And of course, then we had a uh, strong reading there as well. Because of course, the size isn't as large. We have a, a lower count, but still a, uh, from the, <laughs> the little bit that uh, highlight that was there, certainly plenty high enough. So absolutely a amazing specimen, a rare specimen. This has fluorite, which uh, is, um, here, here's the other thing. Let me show you what you would think. Maybe this white here, look at that. That's what's neat about this uh, Geiger counter. You can tell what something is or isn't. So that's only picking up readings from this other area. The, all this white area here is not highlight. It's just more matrix. If it was, 
highlight in some form, it would certainly read higher than it is. So uh, it is only getting um, the uh, radioactive reading from the only two places the highlight are in this. And it is really stunning, the, the highlight. Um, is some of the best. In other words, if I took a picture of this, I could easily get it in the MINDAT for an example of highlight. It is one of the best examples of highlight I have seen um, and certainly has all the bells and whistles that highlight should have, which of course includes um, the fluorescence and a radioactive signature. I don't really want it. There we go. Look at that. What a great, that's a natural way it sits. And you can see the highlight along with fluoride, along with the crystals. It is an extremely aesthetic piece. And it is from Irongo, Namibia, a very desirable locality for that uh, to be from as, as well. So um, I have a uh, wonderful opportunity on this, again, to a uh, responsible collectors out there, even though this one's not too bad. Um, it's certainly for anybody because of the highlight. It's definitely a uh, collector's piece um, for only $148. All right, give me a moment to put this up properly and I'll be right back. All right, you're saying, oh, that's beautiful. Yes, it is. I said I would have something else from the Brandberg area and this is certainly a classic Brandberg, which is really, um, you talk about the Cacavel Plateau uh, in the Rongo Mountains. I actually was invited by a well-known mineral dealer, a doctor and his wife who actually lived there and met him at a, a show at the TELUS Museum, actually. And they were so kind and they were so um, sincere and invited to give us the whole works, a tour of the Rongo uh, mines, um, buying, oh my goodness. Um, I was, um, Raven and I were just like, oh, how could we pull it off and, and do that? But we just, just couldn't um, make it to Namibia. Imagine that. So um, I think about that missed opportunity, though, all the time. Uh, anyway, Namibia has some stunning uh, geology and amazing gems and minerals, and gems, everything from diamonds on the coast to, uh, of course, you know, extremely fine specialties and. You know, amethyst, just so many. Um, it has the Sumed mine, you know, which has over 350 minerals that have been cataloged, that have been found at the Sumed mine itself. So we'll talk about that in a little bit on something else. So I have some stunning stuff. I better get going. Look at this. Look at the size of this. So this is, you know, a cabinet size cabinet quality specimen and a classic that is perched there so perfectly. And look at the termination. Uh, it is in pristine condition. And look at something else that I'm actually just discovering as we push in a little closer. You're going to see inclusions in here that are desirable other than irises you see these dark inclusions, most likely you have hematite in there. And then, um, you know, Namibia used to be, of all things, a German colony. So um, you have some of those colonial names left over and uh, Brandenburg sounds like one of them. Uh, let me turn my uh, Geiger counter off. Don't drive you crazy. I did check this. No uh, radioactivity. You have a wonderful amethyst um, phantoms uh, type formations in this crystal that is um, so classic and typical of the Brandenburg amethyst. And the other thing that is typical is to have also anhydros in them. So, uh, yeah, there you go, Dave. 
Um, I have not checked this one thoroughly or well at all for that. You may want to look at that as well. He, look at that. Again, a pristine termination. Crystal collectors are so, I mean, uh, the real picky crystal collectors are very particular about those sort of things. So you see all these little dots? If we can look at those a little bit, Dave, um, are we in all the way or do I have to get my back? Anyway, these little dots uh, you can see are uh, neat hematite inclusions. Um, then look at what this is perched on. This is a myriad. If we go in, you can see that you have, look at this, beautiful little clusters of quartz crystals. You know, some clear as um, can be, others formed differently. And when you look at it like this, you can see, look at, there we go. As we go through the different focal planes, you can look how they pop up and you can just discover each one separately and individually check it out when you get this look at that see that oh i have to get my pointer because this this is what makes specimens and this is what you see in beautiful pictures um displayed look at that so you have a incredible little burst of crystals, quartz crystals, coming right out of there. Look at that. And it looks like they have a little bit of a smoky color. Let me actually, that excites me so much. Let me actually look at that closer for a minute um, because that's such a interesting, um, here, let me get this, this tool, a lower magnification here. Um, Ah, there we go. Oh, hold on. That was pretty dirty, wasn't it? Well used. Okay, now, let me right back to there. So let's look. Look at that. Look at that. That is so exciting. I mean, those are water clear, perfect form. And just uh, look at look at the one on the left. It even has some of the little hematite inclusions on it as well. So that look at that. As I look at this now, you're discovering it with me. As I look at some of these other crystals, I do see what is helping make some of them be a little bit cloudier. Is some of the like you can see right there. Uh, most likely other hematite inclusions on them. Then also, I see some of this uh, clay type material, if it's not some type of other mineral that is actually perched or formed um, in a crystalline fashion. Then wait a second. See, I, I didn't look at this well enough. I am seeing for the first time, look at this formation underneath here. Those look like, and I didn't even test it or anything, but they look uh, and, um, like calcites, definitely like calcites, uh, like dog tooth calcites. And look at their point coming down and going up. So what a neat little pocket right there. Um, look at this, let's see, that is also looks like there's mica. So there's mica that I haven't notated. Uh, the calcites um, you see there, and then let's turn this around and look at these. Here is also, it looks like calcite over quartz, but you're going to have to explore this yourself. Here's the backside, which has another whole story to tell of the matrix. Here is a uh, little vein of quartz. Then look at these layers. Look at this. You have 
um, what would have been a pocket, but the crystals grew from the top and the bottom, closing it up. And it looks like those smoky quartz crystals. Wow, that is pretty cool. That is on the other side of here. So I, I, that's what I just love. I love to look at specimens like this and just try to understand what happened, how they formed, what took place. This, though, sets it off. When you have a specimen that is perched so perfectly, aesthetically like that, and is a great representation for uh, a specimen from that area, wow. And then, when you can have something like that for an amazing, amazing price, um, truly, uh, the, those kind of specimens sell for big, big money. This one, not so big. How about only $148? $148. That is exceptional value and um, a, a, a treasure to behold. Now, let me show you, because I said I was going to item number 115924. 115924. We'll take both of these out. The, these are those. These are those. Hmm. <laughs> Look at that. Beautiful zircons. And look at the incredible cutting. And of course, zircon has a uh, wonderful dispersion. Look at that. And here is the most amazing part is that I showed these before and no one got them. Look at the back. Look how clean they are. Look at the cutting. Look at those. The, these are modified Portuguese ovals. And they have the um, brilliance to show for it. Look, look at that. Beautiful, beautiful stones. They're matched and um, polished girdles, finished wonderfully. And I tell you what, uh, look, look at the um, dichroic nature of them. Do you see the different colors from the different angles? If you hadn't noticed that, look for, and you'll, you'll notice that in those stones. Um, love that kind of stuff. Uh, here we go. How, how about them? Okay, so showed it before. You did well, all right. So I'll discount them, right? That's what I do is lose money. Why not? Make them $36. Can you believe that? $36. That is like $11 or $12 a carat. Wow. Wow. <laughs> you know, so when you break it down, they're $18 a stone. Really? Wow. Okay. Now, many more items. Okay, let me. Um, <laughs> okay, okay, here we go. <laughs> let me make you go. Wow. Item number 1170124. 117-0124. Okay, so let's start off with it right like that. And this is uh, the original box as I, as I got this. And this, again, an estate item. Very hard to find. Let me show you. Yep, you see already in the graphics from the uh, Candice mine. Look at this. We talked about Shattuckite earlier. Well, I had one more. Yeah, that was the bad side, if there is such. Look at that. Look at that. Many things to explore on this. It's just on some goop, which you know how much I do not like this, but luckily it comes all the way off. Look at this. Start with a malachite crystal. Look at that. 
What a fine quality. True crystal of malachite, as you can see uh, the crystalline nature from that angle. Then look at these vesicles these, these, uh, that, were, that was quartz. Then I'm not exactly sure everything that went on here, but you may have um, something discolored the, the, the edge here of the quartz, it looks like. So maybe something um, bleached out. I don't know if it's a bluish tint. Oh, look at that angle. Um, and look at the lighter color layer of blue. Whether that's still Shattuckite, I am not positive. Look at that kind of almost butterfly shape. But let's go in here. This is what is so stunning is this is Shattuckite and much of it is with quartz, on quartz and in quartz. Let's go closer on here and show you. Okay, let's show you with this. You can see the quartz crystals popping up here or when I turn it here at the angle. I have, and you look it down in this vug. Look at the quartz crystals down in this vug. Let me pull this down here, Dave, and let's get a little bit more light so you can do whatever you can. Uh, look it down in here. Wow. Looking at it on the monitor, the, in other words, big screen TV, like you probably are looking at it at home, it's amazing. Look at that back in there. It just keeps going and you can see quartz crystals all the way back there. As we come around here to the top, you can see the shatokite as it envelops some quartz is internal in some of the crystals. And, wow, look at that. and how it envelops some of the quartz, is internal in some of the quartz, and then the quartz is, some of it is just on, uh, on top. This is a very, one of those collector specimens you would see um, a picture of on a cover of a, of a magazine, and wishing that you had one like it. Well, you can now. That almost, the one there you see, the bigger one, almost looks doubly terminated right there, which would be special. There's some others. Look at those quartz crystals. That is breathtaking. And you have, look at right down in the middle of the lens, I see a secular needles of, um, in other words, uh, those like hairs which is, you can see right along there as well. I am in awe of this specimen. There is the malachite crystal. This has, uh, is, is a striking collector's piece. And as far as size specimens go, a lot of them, you know, unless you want to pay, you know, four or five figures for a piece, they aren't much bigger. You can see this is a uh, actual nice size when I was comparing um, other specimens. This is an exceptional piece, really, especially you have to consider these uh, quartz, and I assume quartz. Maybe that is the wrong thing to do. If it is something beyond that, then it's something uh, additionally much more um, valuable simple as that but I like those yeah let's do that there we go I can see these crystals the, the crystals much better um, the different vugs on this and the growth of the shatokite uh, lining them is stunning and then of course all these little vugs of quartz as we turn this on the back you can see that the shatokite is in uh, the quartz, just like gem silica, 
and it would be the shadokite um, creating the color versus gem silica, you have more like copper ions bleeding into the quartz to give it that color. In this case, I think it's just actual uh, shadokite in quartz and not any copper. So shadokite is a copper uh, silicate and named after the Shattuck mine in Bisbee, Arizona. But the Shattuckite from Namibia is uh, really very uh, fine specimens it is known for. And this is um, from the Candice mine. And uh, you know exactly, of course, where it comes from is always important especially to me. Look, look at that. Look at that. I, I could stare at that all day long. We're just sit it. Oh, let's see. There's so many different ways it could be displayed aesthetically. Right there is not too bad, showing off a little malachite and the quartz with the shadokite. But that doesn't even show that wonderful pocket right there. So would I want to display it this way? Maybe. I don't know. I like those quartz crystals. <laughs> I'm a silly person. OK, so let's get to price. Um, don't have another one. That is, as far as I know, there are no more Shattuckite. And I am going to do this one also. So it gives you three choices of, uh, well, yeah, that specimen's amazing. Um, I'll, I'll mark it down. I'll make it only $148. So you have three $148 specimens, I think, uh, to choose from here. And again, this is exceptional piece. Those quartz crystals involved with it really add some oomph to it and pizzazz. OK, I better get moving. All right, um, let's look at 1170224. 1170224. Here is another beauty. And wow, look at this. Look at this. And it self displays perfectly. Uh, incredible pink tourmaline from Brazil with Clevelandite. The Clevelandite is the little cream colored blades you see. Clevelandite being a uh, type of feldspar uh, that is a bladed feldspar. And uh, so you have that with it. And then some, look at that, beautiful, beautiful tourmaline crystals and uh, some wonderful, wonderful just classic white quartz. You can see some of the skeletal uh, remnants of the negative impression from other crystals. But that is just a nice small cabinet specimen that uh, I can offer for a very inexpensive price for the look and the money on this, which on this is going to be only $78 on that. Only $78. So um, big look for not a lot of money on there. Now, next, what do we have here? Everything is so cool. Um, Oh, here, here is one you are not going to see. This is, again, another unique piece. It is item number 117-1024. 117-1024. It is amazing when, if you pick this up how heavy it feels. That is your lead carbonate, your cerusite. Sarusa being a Latin word meaning white lead. It belongs to the aragonite group. Now, aragonite group, remember, so it's PBCO3. Remember, calcite is CaCO3. 
um, siderite, FeCO3. So the CO3s, they actually, aragonite is a, um, just a calcium carbonate. It's a polymorph of calcite. So this is your lead carbonate. So this is lead. There is lead in this. So think of your lead sulfide being galena that is extremely heavy, but yet looks like lead. It's very metallic looking. This has a high uh, percentage of lead by way of its um, molecular weight, which takes the weight, added weight of the carbon and the oxygen. And yeah, they actually have weights to the um, atoms. So anyway, the molecular weight of this is mostly all in the lead, and so you really can feel it at 41 grams. From the Cockerfield Plateau, which is same place up in Namibia where so much other items are discovered. Look at that, you can see that reflection actually all at the uh, same level, um, which is kind of unique. It has a conchoidal fracture. This piece, if you facet cerusite, it has such a high uh, dispersion. It is beautiful, faceted, but it's a very soft material. Look at this. This is facet grade. Wow. Look at the clarity two parts of this. This is a uh, wonderful crystal, but it also could be faceted. And I've always wanted to facet a cerusite, only because of the, um, the look it would have afterwards. But this is a, thank you, sir, a unique and unusual crystal, and one that would, I'm sure, add to your uh, crystal collection that you don't have. Hardness of three to three and a half. Price on this is only $48. Only $48 on that. So making it affordable. Let me put these away later and keep going here so I can get to all the goodies that I brought for you. Oh, wow. Item 1170924. <laughs> Yes, uh, they are going to keep on coming. Take a look at this. Here is a treasure. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Look at that. Of course, that is a fluorite um, piece. And I tell you what, it has stunning and I mean stunning blue fluorescence. This is from um, the Okarusa mine that closed in 2014. Again, this is from Irongo, Namibia as well. And stunning, which I seldom, I don't think I've ever really used that word as part of a description, but the blue fluorescence, it was so strong. I was like, I have never seen anything turn so blue. Let me show you. Let me show you some of the colors in this. Let me actually use this other light here. And there we go. Um, look, look at this. So you have, look at those, look at that, uh, the phantom growths. You have, you can see that. Look at the uh, purple edges. Wow, look at that. Um, what is that? that? That crystal has grown around. Wow, look at the other colors. I just changed the angle on this a little bit. Let's see what is right there in the, in the middle. That is, uh, you can still see it from over here. Kind of cool. Uh, see, I don't, I didn't even check these things out. If I all of a sudden see a big bubble in one of these, water moving back and forth, it's mine. All right, look, look at all these beautiful different um, phantoms and the uh, layered growth that is, uh, um, you can see in fluorites. What is along that edge? I, don't think. Um, I think it has some static electricity involved with it as well, actually. So, a wonderful little uh, display piece for fluorite from a um, 
mine that is now closed. So that is uh, always an important price on that. This guy is only $58. If you're a fluorescent collector, this would be worth it for that. And I am wondering what's inside that crystal right there that I can easily see. Um, that might uh, be something of added value that I certainly did not account for, but that's, uh, that's the way I roll. <laughs> okay, let's see what we have here. Okay, oh yeah, 117-1224. 117-1224, here's something else that will make you go wow. Now, and something you haven't seen, the, it has both in it. It is a polymorph of rutile known as brookite. Check this out. Look at this. Look at this. Okay, so the darker you see, the, the darker crystals you see is brookite. Brookite is a titanium dioxide as well, TiO2. Same thing as rutile. The golden needles you see in this, and you can see them shooting right across there, they're kind of random in this uh, piece. You can see them throughout the uh, crystal. You have to kind of look for them. Once you notice and see them, then you can spot them. So you see all those little reflections off of all those little crystals. There's a group of, um, look, look at that. So the golden ones are rutile. The darker crystals are brookite. And brookite, it's a polymorph. So remember, a polymorph is the same crystalline form, same formula, different um, crystal formation. So brookite is orthorhombic, and rutile and anatase, which anatase is another polymorph. I've showed you anatase crystals before. They almost look like uh, bipyramidal spinel crystal uh, type of look. But that is one of it. Uh, Brookite has five different polymorphs in nature. Five different polymorphs uh, to, or you could say rutile has five polymorphs. Brookite is one of them. Anatase is another. And I say anatase because I've offered anatase before here. And they're actually bluish, bluish in color. And they, rutile and anatase, are tetragonal. So, um, and, and uh, you can see these other needles of the rutile, and then, of course, very obvious, the brookite. This piece is remarkable, and this isn't any kind of a break. This is just, again, the negative impression where another crystal uh, was. Now, those are a couple of conchoidal chips along there, it looks like. But this certainly has the striking look that um, is desirable. Look at the golden needles there at that angle. A little bit of both there. And then the um, beautiful brookite. OK, so the price on this guy, how about this? Something for everybody, $28. Only $28. I have no idea. Uh, I am sure that that is way undervalued. Let me show you. 1170524. Oh boy. Oh boy. Yep. I didn't uh, just show all the best to start. Here is another goodie, and this is the way I got it in this box. And let me show you what's inside. Look at this. Again, another Namibian crystal. And what Namibia is well known for, and this is from the Sumed mine, which closed in 1996, which is one of the most famous mines. It has produced over 350 different minerals have been cataloged there, numerous it was mined for numerous type of metallic ores. And one of its um, amazing specimens was and is dioptase. And look at this. It is dioptase on calcite crystals. Look at those calcites. Let me show you this color. This is a remarkable clarity. Look at that. 
that is a jewel. I've always wanted to cut a dioptase, dioptase as well. Let me show you this backlighting here. Dave, if we can catch this. And in this wavelength, let me show you. Green is always difficult to bring out. This look at this crystal. Just a beautiful, and it is just undamaged. Look at that. Now let me show you once more here. And we'll take it away. Let me turn this light off and give you one more look at it in this view. Again, stunning. Thank you, sir. So it has a incredible color and incredible formation to those crystals. And the calcites, the bed of calcite that it is on, look at that, are just wonderful little crystals as well. It's just striking. Okay. Price on this one also, an excellent opportunity. It's only $98, only $98, really a great value. Now, let me show you, I want to get this in. This is item 117-1224, 117-1224, let's see. Let's say uh, that's the wrong piece. Okay, hold on. Oh, wrong item number. Sorry about that. Uh, it's item number 117022. Wait, hold on. Huh, I'll figure it out. Where was that? I have. Okay, let me get. Here we go. because this one, it's 117-1324, 117-1324. And wow, I don't know where to start with it. Don't know where to start with it. But look at that, dropping it right in there. What a great shot that was. Talk about botroidal malachite. This is cabinet quality and cabinet size piece. This is, a, Beautiful display of botroidal malachite. If you have malachite, you probably have fibrous malachite. You probably have concentric malachite. You will not have botroidal malachite, but it doesn't stop there. Look at the barite. This piece is extremely heavy. Do again to barite. Barite is a very heavy mineral. You have all this color of iron oxide stained uh, barite. Then look at over here. Look at that as we come in. Look at the banding to that azurite. Talk about an incredible look, and it becomes very collectible when you have that formation of azurite right there like that. In between, look at this, fibrous malachite, a layer of fibrous malachite it's on. Yeah, look at that. And then, so you have fibrous malachite, you have botroidal malachite, you have barite, there is um, potentially uh, gertite, there are several other minerals I think I noticed on here, most likely uh, dolomite, and then there is these, these minerals, these layers that can, oh, look at the fibrous malachite there, can be blended colors. See that lighter color like there? You can often even find chrysocolla with this, but that right there. So imagine that azurite layer extends back underneath the malachite. Don't know how far, but that is, look at that, a beautiful, beautiful specimen that would uh, display 
um, quite well. Quite well. Oh, love it. And, and you're going to love the opportunity on this. I have it priced. Um, this entire piece, how about this? And I know it's silly, especially with that Azurite banding like that, but uh, for $68. For $68. As the minutes count down, there is so much more I um, wanted to get to, but it looks like I am not going to get to. Let me see what this guy is. Um, Oh yes, let me show this. This goes perfectly next. Item 117-1524. 117-1524. So let's drop to uh, a little different version of Azurite and Malachite and take a look at this guy. Oh, let's take a close look at this guy. Yes, this number if, uh, is 117-1524. Do you have it? No? You need the info then? So here is the info, folks. And you can look at it right here. It is Morocco Malachite Crystal and Azurite Collector Specimen with Betroidal Goethite. You're thinking, what is he talking about? I didn't see any of that. No, you didn't. So why he types that up, let me show you as I turn this specimen around. First, look at the crystalline azurite. Those are crystals of azurite. Can we go in any more? Because there is some beautiful fibrous malachite crystals along with them. Look, look at that. And look at in each of those pockets. Look at that. There's fibrous malachite crystals there. Oh, there's malachite or azurite in all these pockets. But wait, get over here and look at this. Look at the girthite, the botroidal girthite, and then look way in the back, way in the back of that botroidal pocket is azurite and malachite also. Isn't that cool? That is beautiful. That's the stuff I see. There's uh, more info there. That's the stuff I see on the cover of a magazine or in a picture in a, a, a book or offering by somebody else, not something I have ever had. I do now, and I'm offering it to all of you. Okay, so look at all the other little uh, botroidal formations of the girthite, and in the back, you can see little malachite specks or azurite, especially, what if you, I was, wish I was a little guy and could travel back in there. Did you get the uh, info, the rest of it? Let's see, there's three by two inches. And then, of course, there's some quartz. There's a limonite on this, and it's from Buazer. And look at the crystals on the end. The azurite crystals, very desirable. You have all the info there, sir? Here, let's do get that. Yep. And so let me go ahead and Dave, if one last uh, close up in here to show off some of these crystals. Look at, look at how well formed they are. And the oh, look at the quality, look at the clarity, look at the transparency to them. And then with the malachite crystals, malachite crystals, mixed in, uh, maybe some other things besides malachite. Look at, look at all that beautiful azurite cluster. You could um, softly clean that out too. Look at the malachite back in there as well. Wow, look at the down in that vug, look at that. <laughs> what a specimen. Look at those. Ah, look at that. See the crystals back in there, a little bit different color. They could be some, look at the fibrous malachite crystals. That is stunning. Anyway, I could look at that all day, of course, and uh, wouldn't know what side to look at. You have uh, the azurite, 
or look at that, you have the Gertite. Stunning, stunning. Okay, how about this? How about that piece for only, since it's the last item of the show, let's make it only $38. I kid you not, $38 on that. Last item on the show, I'll be back with trivia. Okay, there was an entire tray of intended items <laughs> I wanted to get to. So I think big and, uh, and the small in the number of items I want to show. So it depends. Do you want a you know, show and sell show or do you want to show and tell? These kind of items can't just be shown here, spin it around, it's so much money. If I didn't tell you and point out what each and every different mineral was to start with, where would you begin? So uh, it's important that you have that base knowledge, like malachite. Malachite's a gemstone. It's used in some of the finest jewelry there is. And I'll bet you know more about malachite than 99% of the people selling it here or other where. Other, you know, how many different forms of it have you seen? How many places have you seen it to be from? You know the chemical formula of it. You know that you can't cut it without using water because the dust from it is poisonous. You know it's a copper mineral. You know it's found in the, in the DRC, Democratic Republic of the Congo, and many other places as well. So um, the levels of knowledge you are in are so far beyond uh, so many others and that uh, and you know I don't take all the credit for it because you have to remember it you have to I, I hope I stir up interest enough that you actually go and do further searches of the item shown um, and information about it one of the ones I, I one of my biggest regrets of the one mineral specimen I remember selling is the one that we talk about that I couldn't sell for a few bucks, yet I ended up showing you one of the finest specimens of girthite you have ever seen. The other specimen, and that was all part of my collection, was that one, a Betroida one, like from the four-man mine. And you know what else, which other one? Yeah, the regretful one. Yeah, you forgot about this one, the Turgite. Another name for the incredibly iridescent Gertite found from Graves Mountain, Georgia. That specimen that um, one of the members of the family was lucky enough to get was incredibly amazing and one of those that will be no more. Who would have thought that something that could be so, um, you know, rub off on your hands. Raven does it like it because she has to pick it and deal with it and package it. But yet, two of its forms, the iridescent turgite from Graves Mountain and the incredible crystalline gertite I showed you today from Colorado, both made in the USA, both from my collection, um, from, of my USA collection, and now, you know, I pass them on uh, for you to enjoy them at the level that I did. So, you know, when some of the ones, you know, there's been so many pieces that I have loved and now I'm sharing, and not with, you know, there is, a, you know, of course, some, some regret, but to know that I'm passing them on to the family, so to speak, it makes me feel good um, as to know where they're going. Because, you know, if I was to pass in an untimely manner, look at what all someone would have had to deal with. So in this way, um, doing it now, it's um, for all of you, it's like getting your inheritance early, right? <laughs> While I'm still alive, I wish I could get that. Um, but it... Uh, and I always thought people with big money, why not give it to them when they are alive so you can see the joy in them <laughs> and so you can see where your money goes, good, bad, or indifferent. You know, when money gets passed on after you pass away, when you have so much of it, 
um, why not why not give it while you're alive? I always thought that that I would be that way. I would want to and in in this way, believe me, I have no other money except what I have collected over 50 plus years in mineral specimens. And uh, even though, you know, I can't take them to the bank, I can share them all with you. And over 4,000 plus specimens sold in seven years without having to have bought, cross my heart, without having been to a show or bought a single specimen tells you just how passionate <laughs> I am about collecting mineral specimens, and you're not to our actual bottom line personal collection. So enjoy all of these as much as I am enjoy passing them on to you. Now, expect some of the questions to get a little harder from time to time. Maybe these two are some of them. You um, did fairly well on the, you know, what am I? and. Um, there's always uh, more fun ahead. So let's t uh, try two more questions. Okay, Cerucite's formula is PbCO3. Pb standing for pum bum in Latin meaning lead. It was lead, so it's a lead carbonate, Cerucite. We talked about that uh, clearish white crystal and how heavy it was. Um, and we talked about what family it came from. So, cerucite's formula is PbCO3, a carbonate which belongs to what mineral group? What mineral group does it belong to? And all minerals are named and belong to a specific group. Um, you know, uh, and it's, it's weird to think of it sometimes because you have um, Fe2O3, which is hematite and iron oxide, but Fe2O3 is almost identical to Al2O3, except aluminum substitutes for the iron. This should be a question, but it's not. It is called an analog. So hematite is the analog of corundum, which is ruby and sapphire. So that's how closely related hematite is to something such as ruby and sapphire corundum. The only difference being, and it makes all the difference in the world, whether that first element is iron, which gives you hematite and all of its um, ore forms, O-R-E, all of those forms of hematite that you see. And its softness, its darkness, its rust colored, its, you know, black. And all you have to do is change the first element from iron to aluminum, Al203, and you get a hardness of nine. It is corundum, it is ruby and sapphire, the uh, really most precious gemstone there is. Um, and it's, so they call it the analog of, it's that closely related to, to hematite and putting it in a similar um, family group. So, uh, here is the second question. So anyway, so will we, cerucite's formula is PbCO3, a carbonate, which belongs to what mineral group? That's question one. Question two, name two polymorphs of rutile. We have talked about and sold two polymorphs of rutile in this show. Name both of them. There's actually five in nature, but the um, ones that you'll run across, and in this show we have come across two other polymorphs. Now remember, 
Polymorph means same chemical formula, but is uh, basically identical except a different, uh, belongs to a different crystal system, uh, giving you sometimes a completely different um, look and uh, gemstone. Think about uh, kyanite being a polymorph of um, andalusite and silimonite. Yeah, my head's full of all that stuff. <laughs> so look, think of how different kyanite is from silimonite and from um, andalusite. I mean, you know, completely different, all three, and yet the same chemical formula. So it is something important to understand and to know um, these basic facts about minerals that you, mainly being one that you can have the same chemical makeup of one and yet due to a different crystal system be completely different in so many aspects of it. And um, polymorph, something to understand enough even, you know, don't have to deeply understand it, but for general understanding, as a mineral collector, I think it's Im important if you collect minerals. So, name two polymorphs of Rutil. That's it. Hope everyone has had a great holiday and uh, continuing your holiday. Some of you start it with Easter. Some of you end it with the Easter weekend as far as spring break goes. Others of you, it's not even associated with Easter. So. However it goes this spring, I hope your holiday break is a, uh, a nice one and the weather is good for you. And uh, it's been so tragic for uh, other people, which is uh, sad, especially during this, this week, um, to lose any other family members that uh, we have seen in the news recently. So um, you never know what the next day is going to bring you. So um, hug your loved ones, tell them you love them. I love and appreciate all of you from um, the bottom of my heart, and I know Austin's heart and David's heart. I mean, you know, we're three guys, but we actually tell each other that we love each other, and that's the kind of brotherhood it should be. And the world needs to um, be the same way, you know? All, all of us um, in going in one direction and uh, with, with love in our hearts. Get to know the rock before you take your dirt down. <laughs> wow. Has Asif so, um, so spiritually put it, he said, get to know your rocks before you take your dirt nap. <laughs> and with that, we will end the show. And um, God bless all of you. Stay safe. And see you next Monday. Cheers.